bunch of whiny little fucking brats who think I should only pay attention to them and them only, okay? Brutalize them. Do you understand? Whip them into fucking shape. I do not want to hear from a single motherfucker with like a 20-month subscription right now. That mob was violent and destructive, and many came armed. As you will hear, Secret Service agents protecting the vice president were exceptionally concerned about his safety and their own. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy was scared, as were others in Congress, even those who themselves helped to provoke the violence. Boo, fuck you, Lucy. And as you will see today, Donald Trump's own White House counsel, his own White House staff, members of his own family, all implored him to immediately intervene to condemn the violence and instruct his supporters to stand down, leave the Capitol, and disperse. For multiple hours, he would not. Donald Trump would not get on the phone and order the military or law enforcement agencies to help. And for hours, Donald Trump chose not to answer the pleas from Congress, from his own party, and from all across our nation to do what his oath required. He refused to defend our nation and our Constitution. He refused to do what every American president must. In the days after January 6th, almost no one of any political party would defend President Trump's conduct, and no one should do so today. Thank you, and I now recognize the gentlewoman from Virginia. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Article 2 of our Constitution requires that the President swear a very specific oath every four years. Every President swears or affirms to faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and to the best of their ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution social climber. of the United States. The President also assumes the constitutional duty to take care that our nation's laws be faithfully executed and is the Commander-in-Chief of pissed. our military. This is Can we watch the music video? Our hearings have shown the many ways in which President Trump tried to stop the peaceful transfer of power in the days leading up to January 6. With each step of his plan, he betrayed his oath of office and was derelict in his duty. Tonight, we will further examine President Trump's actions on the day of the attack on the Capitol. Early that afternoon, President Trump instructed tens of thousands of supporters at and near the Ellipse rally a number of whom he knew were armed with various types of weapons, to march to the Capitol. After telling the crowd to march multiple times, he promised he would be with them. How come we're still watching this knowing the outcome won't be any different? PM, because, hey, like if you're upset, remember that there were community members in here that are like long-term community subs who were like shocked that I wasn't watching this. Like there was someone in here that literally said, how are you not watching the January 6th commission right now? And I actually uh, abandoned them for the day. So let's walk down you begged for this, okay? And there is some, at least, relatively interesting uh, commentary that'll come out of this. So just let it happen for a second. And, you know, if it's super fucking boring, we will leave. You should ironically host the chatter afterwards. Ask streamers to nominate top trash chatters for different categories. What? Also, this is the last one, okay? This is the last day, the last fucking uh, primetime event or whatever. Politics frogs eat so much and still complain, Lamau. No, I know. They're disgusting. They are fat little piggies. Like Actually, everyone told President Trump to condemn the violence in clear and unmistakable terms. And those on Capitol Hill, they eat the most and, and freak the, the fuck out when they president don't eat. Trump to help. But the former president chose not to do what all of those people begged. He refused to tell the mob to leave until 417 when he tweeted out a video statement filmed in the Rose Garden, ending with this. So go home. We love you. You're very special. You've seen what happens. You see the way others are treated. That Look. Are so bad and so evil. Look, they're trying to nail him on three fucking different things, okay? 
uh, what is it like conspiracy to defraud the public um, conspiring to engage in sedition like a seditionist conspiracy which they're not going to be able to get him on because he doesn't I don't think that there's any direct link between him and like the Proud Boys or whatever or the people who are like directly linked to the seditionist acts um, it's just like it's just it's it's silly like the things that they're trying to nail him on are not going to be they're, they're not going to be easy to fucking pin him on ultimately he might still get out to be honest what do you mean might still get out he is out and he will continue to be out most importantly because most importantly because libs are fucking running the show including uh liz cheney who was also a lib if johnny depp can win his defamation trial they can nail him for this no motherfucker because johnny depp had actually competent lawyers and the problem with the democratic party is that they are incompetent and they're pussies they're cowards they do not want to fucking actually take down Donald Trump or anything. This is just television, okay? This is just theater. That's it. What you will learn is that President Trump sat in his dining room. They need room. the Secret Service text? Yeah, except the Secret Service literally fucking deleted them. So good luck. And watch the attack on television. American on. president. I served proudly for 20 years as an officer in the United States Navy. Veterans of our armed forces know firsthand the leadership that's required in a time of crisis, urgent and decisive action that puts duty and country first. But on January 6th, when lives and our democracy hung in the balance, President Trump refused to act because of his selfish desire. Yeah, the to sad, stay. pathetic truth is that, like, uh, you know, on top of the uh, midterm campaigning strategy gift that the Republican Party gift-wrapped and hand-delivered to the motherfucking uh, Dems in the form of, like, uh, brutality and, and just, like, you know, purposeless cruelty, this is their midterm strategy. This is literally their midterm strategy. It's like primetime television. They were unironically fucking talking about how, like, God damn, Kinzinger's got some ears on him. Uh, this, is, this was literally promoted as primetime TV. Like... Apparently, they went and hired like a TV director, like an Emmy award winning TV director to like put this entire thing together. You got an assault going on on the capital of the United Television States. Television channels have canceled their shows to show you this. And there's nothing. No call. Nothing. Do you heard that? Yeah, probably. Like my colleague from Virginia, I'm a veteran. I served in the Air Force, and I serve currently in the Air National Guard. I can tell you that General Milley's reaction to President Trump's conduct is 100% correct. And so was Leader McCarthy's. What explains President Trump's behavior? Why did he not take immediate action in a time of crisis? Because President Trump's plan for January 6th was to halt or delay Congress's official proceeding to count the votes. The mob attacked the Capitol quick, the, the mob attacking the Capitol quickly caused the evacuation of both the House and the Senate. The count ground to an absolute halt and was ultimately delayed for hours. The mob was accomplishing President Trump's purpose, so of course he didn't intervene. Here's what will be clear by the end of this hearing. President Trump did not fail to act during the 187 minutes between leaving the ellipse and telling the mob to go home, he chose. Motherfuckers like, I, I wasn't there, but I heard it. You know what I mean? that day who honored their oaths. Adam Kinzinger be like, I put my ear to the ground and, and I heard everything. I heard the rumbles. And to safeguard our democracy. Many of them are here tonight with us and many more are watching from home. <laughs> As you already know, and we'll see again tonight, their service and sacrifice shines a bright light on President Trump's dishonor and dereliction of duty. I yield to the vice chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Kinzinger. I'd like to begin by welcoming our witnesses this evening. Tonight, we're joined by Mr. Matthew Pottinger. Mr. Pottinger is a decorated former Marine intelligence officer who served this nation on tours of duty in Afghanistan and Iraq. He served in the Trump White House from the first day of the administration through the early morning hours of January 7th, 2021. 
The last role in which he served in the White House was as Deputy National Security Advisor to the President of the United States. We're also joined by Sarah Matthews. Ms. Matthews started her career in communications, working on Capitol Hill, serving on the Republican staffs of several House committees. She then worked as Deputy Press Secretary for President Trump's re-election campaign before joining the Trump White House in June of 2020. She served there as Deputy Press Secretary and Special Assistant to the President until the evening of January 6, 2021. I will now swear in our witnesses. The witnesses will please stand and raise their right hands. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you, you may be seated. And let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you both again for being here tonight. Mr. Pottinger, uh, thank you for your service to the nation uh, as well as, as for joining us this evening. Can you please briefly explain what your responsibilities were as Deputy National Security Advisor to the President? Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, when I started at the White House, I was a senior director for Asia on the National Security Council staff. So that was a job that involved helping coordinate the President's Asia policy, um, I supported the president when he met or uh, interacted with Asian leaders. Uh, later, 2019, I was promoted to the job of Deputy National Security Advisor. Uh, in that role, uh, I was uh, the chairman of the Deputies Committee. That's an NSC uh, uh, meeting of all the deputy cabinet secretaries. We would settle uh, important matters of, uh, of uh, national policy related to, to our national security. And we would also tee up options for the president and uh, for his cabinet members. Uh, it was, um, I, I felt then as I do now that it was a privilege to serve in the White House. Uh, I'm, I'm also very proud of President Trump's foreign policy accomplishments. We were able to uh, finally compete with China. We were uh, also able to broker uh, peace agreements between Israel and, and three Arab states. I mean, those are some examples of the types of policies that I think made uh, our country safer. Thank you, Ms. Pottinger. And were you in uh, the White House during the attack on the Capitol? On Bro, January this is 6th? so dumb. Uh, for most of the day, I was uh, in the White House, although when the, the president was speaking at the rally, I was actually off site at a scheduled meeting with India's ambassador to the United States. Uh, uh, the National Security Council staff was not involved in organizing the security for what was a domestic event, the rally. Uh, but um, I did return to the White House at roughly 2.30 p.m. Thank you. And I know my colleagues will have additional questions for you about that afternoon. Um, let me turn now to you, Ms. Matthews. How did you come to join President Trump's White House staff? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. As you outlined, I am a lifelong Republican and um, I joined the Trump re-election campaign in June of 2019. I was one of the first communications staffers actually on board for his re-election campaign. And during that time, um, I traveled all around the country and met Kaylee McEnany, who was also working on his re-election campaign. Um, I worked there for a year and I formed a close relationship with Ms. McEnany and uh, she moved over to the White House in April of 2020 to start as White House press secretary. And she brought over a group of campaign staff with her. And so I joined her over at the White House in June of 2020 to start as her deputy. You know the Democratic Party hired someone from Hollywood to spread this court ruling and beef it up? Yeah, I know. It's just lib agitprop. I know. This doesn't even seem like a real court session. I know. Thank you. And now I'd like to I know the gentleman from Virginia. It's still the the, the uh, most important political event that's happening in our sad fucking country you, at the Madam moment. Chair. So it's good to at least here, be aware of what these Trump fucking the mob to weirdos are doing January and saying. You know what I mean? Before he went on stage, he knew some of them were armed. It's also not a court. Uh, it, it's a, it's a speech, committee he hearing. He them to march to the Capitol. Not court. As he had always planned to do. By the time he walked off the stage... If Hassan knows these things, I wonder why he didn't want to cover this bullshit. I mean, I rarely ever covered it. I only covered it when they brought Trump in with like new information, and that was kind of cool. When they when they were like, "Oh, Trump actually tried to 
wrestle the fucking... Even then they fumbled the bag a little bit when they were like, oh, he tried to wrestle the fucking Secret Service guy, which I think is, like, really funny, so I'm gonna want to believe it, okay? This security but... Told us that the White House was aware of multiple reports of it, it also might motivate Merrick Garland. Bro, Merrick Garland works for Joe Biden, okay? The fuck is this? It might motivate him. What are we doing? Like, this idea... Why do we elect Joe Brandon... If we can't even get the fucking attorney general to do shit without, like, watching television. What the fuck is this? Liberals are so permanently cucked. They're so permanently fucking cucked that they're like, oh, maybe they'll get motivated to do the thing. It's like, bro, that's your job. The thing is, the thing is, like, he, did, he doesn't need to be fucking motivated to do anything. It's his job. It's what he's supposed to do. You should fuck him. To something else if you physically walk to the Capitol. I, I don't know if you want to use the word insurrection, coup, whatever. We all knew that this would move from a normal, uh, democratic, you know, public event into something else. What was what was driving that sentiment, considering this 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 part of it, the actual breach of the Capitol, hadn't happened yet? Why were we alarmed? Right. Uh, the president wanted to lead tens of thousands of people to the Capitol. Um, I think that was enough grounds for us to be alarmed. Even though he understood many of his supporters were armed, the president was still adamant to go to the Capitol when he got off the stage at the Ellipse. But his Secret Service detail was equally determined to not let him go. That led to a heated argument with the detail that delayed the departure of the motorcade to the White House. We have evidence from multiple sources regarding an angry exchange in the presidential SUV, including testimony we will disclose today from two witnesses who confirmed that a confrontation occurred. The first witness is a former White House employee with national security responsibilities. After seeing the initial violence at the Capitol on TV, the individual went to see Tony Ornato, the deputy chief of staff in his office. Mr. Ornato was there with Bobby Ingle, the president's lead Secret Service agent. This employee told us that Mr. Ornato said that the president was, quote, irate when Mr. Ingle refused to drive him to the Capitol. Mr. Ingle did not refute what Mr. Ornato said. The second witness is retired Sergeant Mark Robinson of the DC Police Department, who was assigned to the president's motorcade that day. He sat in the lead vehicle with a Secret Service agent responsible for the motorcade, also called the TS agent. Let's go. Here's how Sergeant Robinson remembered the exchange. Was there any description of what of what was occurring in the car? <laughs> no, only that on the only description I received was that the president was upset and that he was adamant about going to the Capitol and there was a a heated discussion about that. I love and this. I love this. I love this so much. I will never. Bro, say it to Tate. I overpowered you. Yeah, I did say that. Because it did happen. Um, I love this because, like, the idea that Donald Trump wanted to go so bad into that fucking crowd is awesome. About how many times would you say you've been part of that motorcade with the president? <laughs> Probably over a hundred times. Uh, and in that a uh, hundred times, have you ever uh, witnessed uh, another discussion of a uh, argument or heated discussion with the president where the president was contradicting uh, where he was supposed to go or what the Secret Service believed was safe? No. Like other witnesses, Sergeant Robinson also testified that he was aware that individuals in the crowd were armed. Yes, I believe we was on special uh, events channel, and I was monitoring the traffic, and so I can hear some of the units pointing out to individuals that there were individuals uh, along Constitution Avenue that were armed, that were up in the trees, and I can hear the uh, units responding to those individuals. And so there's always a concern when there's a police in the area. And like other witnesses, Sergeant Robinson told us that the president still wanted to travel to the Capitol, even after returning to the White House. 
So at the end of the speech, what was the plan supposed to be? So at the end of the speech, uh, we do know that while inside the limo, the president was still um, adamant about going to the Capitol. That's being relayed to me by the TS agent. And so we did part the ellipse and we responded back to the White House. However, we, the, the motorcade, the POTUS motorcade was placed on standby. And so we were told to stand by uh, on the West Exec until they confirmed whether or not the president was going to go to the Capitol. And so I may have waited, I would just estimate maybe 45 to 45 minutes to an hour um, waiting for Secret Service to make that decision. The motorcade waited at the White House for more than 45 minutes before being released. The committee is also aware that accounts of the angry confrontation in the presidential SUV have circulated widely among the Secret Service since January 6. Recent disclosures have also caused the committee to subpoena yet further information from the Secret Service, which we've begun to receive and will continue to assess. The committee is also aware that certain Secret Service witnesses have now retained new private counsel. We anticipate further testimony under oath and other new information in the coming weeks. After the Secret Service refused to take President Trump to the Capitol, he returned to the White House. What you see on the screen is a photo of him inside the Oval Office immediately after he returned from the rally, still wearing his overcoat. A White House employee informed the President as soon as he returned to the Oval about the riot at the Capitol. Let me repeat that. Within 15 minutes of leaving the stage, President Trump knew that the Capitol was besieged and under attack. At 1.25, President Trump went to the private dining room off the Oval Office. From 1.25 until 4 o'clock, the President stayed in his dining room. Just to give you a sense of where the dining room is situated in the West Wing, Let's take a look at this floor plan. The dining room is connected to the Oval Office by a short hallway. Witnesses told us that on January Andrew, 6th, no President Trump shot. sat in Andrew. his usual spot, at the head of the table facing a television hanging on the wall. We know from the employee that the TV was tuned to Fox News all afternoon. Here you can see Fox News on the TV showing coverage of the joint session that was airing that day at 1.25. Other witnesses confirmed that President Trump was in the dining room with the TV on for more than two and a half hours. There was no official record of what President Trump did while in the dining room. On the screen is the presidential call log from January 6th. No, on the screen was fucking Hassan Abi, twitch.tv slash Hassan Abi. Of President Trump receiving or placing a call between 11.06 and 6.54 p.m. As to what the president was doing that hour. Bro, the funniest part about like all this money that they spent on like recreating this with VFX and all this other shit and like accurately assessing like and detailing every single thing that Donald Trump did in this entire timeline is the underlying reality that we all fucking knew literally on the afternoon, maybe the morning of January 6th, even before the insurrection happened, which is that Donald Trump undeniably knowing full well lied to the American public over and over again about how fucking the election was stolen from him and he wanted people to go fucking crazy and try to disrupt the symbolic process of certifying votes. That's it. So they're spending like gorillions of fucking dollars and trying to be like, hey guys, this is what happened. Here it is. Here's all the evidence. I do understand and appreciate, you know, making sure that this entire process is like, in in the in the Library of Congress, it's uh, like it's they're they're doing this for uh, the record to make sure that there's a record of all of these things, okay? But like, th there's nothing new. Give me something new. Show me the ketchup stains on the fucking wall. Show me Donald Trump trying to fucking choke slam the Secret Service guy. Give me a phone conversation between Donald Trump and like uh, someone. Anyone where he's like, yeah, dude, come on, I hope they go. I hope they go and kill Mike Pence. What the fuck? Give me a fucking dumper photo. A new one. I want to see Trump's fat fucking ass. There's nothing in here. And liberals are like, oh, the humanity, the humanity over and over again. 
And they spent so much fucking time and effort trying to be like, look at what Donald Trump did. Meanwhile, like, nobody cares. Brandon is about to fucking die. Kamala Harris supremacy, okay? It's Kamala time, baby. And Donald Trump's going to run again and probably win. If this is the midterm plan of the Democratic Party, they deserve to lose. They have failed the American people over and over again, and they will continue to do so. Every single dick skin, lanyard wearing dipshit absolutely deserves to be fucking fired. Okay? Every single person that's like, this is our strategy, this is how we're going in the fucking midterms, needs to be fired, jailed. Okay, all the politicians that are doing this need to be jailed. Stealing your own tweet, yes. It's crazy to me. Hassan, this hearing directly impacts my material condition. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. That's the best part. That's the best part. Much like everything the Democratic Party does, this is, of course, incredibly far removed from any meaningful consequence in your life. And that is a joke, by the way. I know he's joking. But some people do unironically feel this way. Your mom and dad that watch MSNBC all the fucking time, your blue and on parents, your Rachel Maddow heads in your family, they feel this way. And they're about to be served with a cold heart fucking long dick of truth. Okay? That nobody gives a fuck about this. No one. It's not even the Democrats' top priority, and it's certainly not the Republicans' top priority. Republican top priority is inflation. Yeah, blue and on, like fucking blue MAGA, like all the people that like think the Democratic Party is like this faceless, lifeless institution is an institution that is infallible and needs to be defended. Okay. No matter how bad the Dems are, you will still vote them. It doesn't matter. Who am I going to vote for? It doesn't even fucking matter. I vote for Democratic Party. It doesn't matter. Nothing changes. I don't vote for the Democratic Party. Nothing changes. I'm, a, I'm in California, you fucking idiot. What are you talking about? Hey, what do you mean? I vote out of principle. I vote for harm reduction. But ultimately, it doesn't fucking matter. You are on yell at chatter mode. Disengage, disengage. That's actually a good take, Gon Smith. Thank you. Thank you for checking me. From that was a good chatter. Said she was, quote, disgusted to hear that news and that it was his duty to do something. And I told her, I said, there's nothing in the Constitution unilaterally that Vice President Pence could do. She said, that doesn't matter. He should have fought for Trump. At 149, here's what was happening at the Capitol with President Trump's fired up supporters. We're going to give Ryan a warning. We're going to try and get compliance, but this is now effectively a riot. 149 hours declaring it a riot. Uh. <laughs> What did President Trump do at 149 as the DC police at the same time were declaring a riot at the Capitol? As you can see on the screen, he tweeted out a link to the recording of his ellipse speech. This was the same speech in which he knowingly sent an armed mob to the Capitol, but President Trump made no comment about the lawlessness and the violence. I yield to the gentleman from Illinois. The next action? President Trump took was to tweet at 2.24 p.m. What happened during the 35 minutes between his last tweet at 1.49 and 2.24, his staff repeatedly came into the room to see him and plead that he make a strong public statement condemning the violence and instructing the mob to leave the Capitol. He did not relent until after 4 o'clock when he went out to go to the Rose Garden to film his now infamous go home message. Pat Cipollone was a top White House lawyer. Here's what he told us about his reaction to seeing the violence and his advice throughout the afternoon. 
when did you first realize that there was actual violence or rioting? I, I first realized that it may have been on television or it may have been Tony or it may have been Bill, but I, I found out that people were, you know, they weren't in the Capitol yet, but they were, you know, and, and then I started watching it and, you know, then I was aware. What specifically did you think? You I think I was pretty clear there needed to be an immediate and forceful response statement, public statement that people need to leave the Capitol now. My question is exactly that. that. It sounds like you, from the very onset of violence at the Capitol, right around 2 o'clock, were pushing for a strong statement that people should leave the Capitol. Is that right? I was at other sorters. Okay. Pat, you, you said that you expressed your opinion forcefully. Could you tell us exactly how you did that? Yeah, I can't. I I'm, I'm, don't have, you know, I, I have to, uh, on the privilege issue, I can't talk about conversations with the president, but I can generically say that I said, you know, people need to be told. There needs to be a public announcement fast that they need to leave the Capitol. And Pat, could you let us know approximately when you said that? Approximately when? Almost immediately after I found out people were getting into the Capitol or approaching the Capitol in a way that was... I pay all these taxes so they can use laptop audio? Yeah, where's the fucking sound in Where's Williams the professionalism? His, his view that the president didn't want to do... This is bullshit! ...was somehow resistant to wanting to say something along the lines that he suggests. Talking about John, not just, just to be clear, many people suggested it. Um, yeah. Not just me, many people felt the same way. Um, I'm sure I had conversations with Mark about this during the course of the day and expressed my, my opinion very forcefully that this needs to be done. So your advice was tell people to leave the Capitol, and it took over two hours when there were subsequent statements made, tweets put forth, that in your view were insufficient. Did you continue, Mr. Cipollone, throughout the period of time up until 417, continue, you and others, to push for a stronger statement? Yes. Were you joined in that effort by Ivanka Trump? Yes. By Eric Hershey? Yes. By Mark Meadow? Yes. White House Counsel's Office wanted there to be a strong statement out to condemn the rioters. I'm confident in that. I'm confident that Ivanka Trump wanted there to be a strong statement to condemn the rioters. Um, I don't know the private conversation she had with Mr. Trump, but I remember when she came to the office one time with White House Counsel's Office, when she came to the Chief of Staff's office with White House Counsel's Office, she was talking about the speech later that day and trying to get her dad on board with saying something that was more direct than he had wanted to at the time and throughout the afternoon. And I think Mark also wanted to get, I remember him getting Ivanka involved because it's like get Ivanka down here because he thought that would be That's uh, awesome. important. Um, I don't think Jared was there in the morning, but I think he came Later, I remember thinking it was important to get. I love that. I love having Ivanka at January 6th uh, leading the insurrection. That could be cool too. You know, a lot of missed opportunities for content from this Trump guy, really. You know, kind of slacking, probably said, deserved to lose the fucking Joe Brandon, honestly. Where there might have been, but for the most part, I remember the both of us going down together, going back, getting on phone calls. He was also very clearly expressing this view. Pat Cipollone and Cassidy Hutchinson, an aide to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, also told us about the Hang Mike Pence chants. As you will see, Mr. Cipollone recalled conversations about those chants in the West Wing, but he relied on executive privilege to maintain confidentiality over his and others' direct communications with the president. Although Mr. Cipollone was unwilling to provide more detail, Ms. Hutchinson provided more explicit information Filling in those blanks. See that for yourself. It wasn't until Mark hung up the phone, handed it back to me. I went back to my desk. A couple minutes later, him and Pat came back, possibly Eric Hirschman too. I'm pretty sure Eric Hirschman was there. 
but I'm I'm confident it was Pat that was there. Um, I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. To which Pat said something, this is effing crazy. We need to be doing something more. Briefly stepped into Mark's office. Effing? Do you remember any discussion at any point during the day about Ryan? Chad, I'm sorry. Clear out your ears. She didn't mean it. Yes, I remember. I remember the hearing that about that yes yeah, yeah. i don't know if i, I don't think any of these people i don't think any of these people drink sparkling water chat line you've drawn but do you remember what you can share with us about the discussion about those chants to hang my tense chants i can tell you my view of that yeah, please my view of that that is outrageous and Bubbly water, sparkling water, water. Vice President of the United States, for people in that crowd to be chanting that, I thought it was terrible. I thought it was outrageous and wrong, and I expressed that very clearly. With respect to your conversations with Mr. Meadows, though, did you specifically raise a concern over the Vice President? Do you, and, do you think this will hurt Trump's wrong. chances of regaining the White House in 2024? <laughs> no. Oh no! What? <laughs> oh no, that's awesome. Fuck no, dude. What the fuck? Bro, this just like gives them uh, an antagonistic relationship with the Democrats once again. You know what I mean? I love that. Chatter, I love how sweet your heart is, okay? If anything, Trump literally. <laughs> should lean in with his chest and be like, I wanted to go. I wanted to go. I wanted to go and storm the halls of Capitol. Obviously, that would like put him, you know, in jail, maybe. Well, not in jail, but like that would definitely be used as like evidence against them. Uh, despite the fact that Democrats are pussies, I think that would be one instance where they won't like, they won't actually fuck that up, but who knows? They probably still would. However, um, the reality is that uh, for his hogs, dude, for the hoglets, oh my God, that makes him look cooler. Yes, it would be awesome. We just heard Mr. Cipollone say that President Trump could have gone to the press. Actually, surprisingly, the polls have shown that his support has gone down a bit only because Ron DeSantis is like a viable candidate now and Trump isn't really active. That's it. The moment Trump goes back down to fucking rallies, the moment the media starts covering his like outrageous takes and shit, the moment he's back, baby, all he needs to do is say like, he needs to literally go on stage and be like, have you seen Nancy Pelosi's titties? What are we doing? Put those puppies away. And then boom, everyone's like, yeah, fucking yeah. I love you, man. That's it. That's literally all it would take for Donald Trump to get like, you know, the entirety of the mainstream media to be like, oh my God, look at how unacceptable and sexist Donald Trump is. Right? And then, and then literally Donald Trump's like, I'm sorry. I'm, you say I'm sexist, but I'm being honest. And then it's done. Do you think the Sanders will actually even try and challenge him? It's right now, it's like a stalemate. directly behind the briefing room and so if he had wanted to make an address from the oval office we could have assembled the white house press corps probably in a matter of minutes to get them into the oval for him to do an on-camera stop pre-cogging for the love of god yeah, thank you other witnesses have given us their views on that question for example general keith kellogg told us that some <laughs> staff were <concerned laughs> this is funny this is the best take i've seen in the chat all day he's gonna win and then say not by enough and do another insurrection to get more votes yeah he's gonna be like i won but not enough we need to storm the arizona <laughs> the arizona capital <laughs> folks believe me i won but not by enough Illegal immigrants voted for the Democrats. 
I yield to the gentlewoman from Virginia. Thank you. As you've heard, by 2 o'clock, multiple staff members in the White House recognized that a serious situation was underway at the Capitol. Personally, I recall being evacuated from the House office building where we're sitting by, uh, before this time. And it was due to the discovery of two pipe bombs in nearby buildings. Ms. Matthews, around the same time, you were watching the violence unfold on television and social media with colleagues, including with Ben Williamson, a senior aide to Mark Meadows and the acting director of communications. You told us that before President Trump sent his next tweet at 2.24, Mr. Williamson got up to go see Mr. Meadows, and you got up to go see Kayleigh McEnany. Why did you both do that? So Ben and I were watching the coverage unfold from one of the offices in the West Wing, and we both recognized that the situation was escalating, and it was escalating quickly, and that the president needed to be out there immediately to um, tell these people to go home and condemn the violence that we were seeing. So I told him that I was going to make that recommendation to Kaylee, and he said he was going to make the same recommendation to the chief of staff, Mark Meadows. Thank you. And one of your colleagues in the press office, Judd Deere, told us he also went to see Ms. McEnany at that time. Let's hear what he said about this critical period of time, right as the Ryers were getting into the By the, the way, Capitol. Real Mellow D, thank you for the 20 gifted uh, subs. And the Basement Goblin, thank services. you for the five gifted subs. Well, I mean, it appears that individuals are... This woman testifying would have been just as happy to stay on if Trump was successful with the January 6th thing, FYI. Okay. You're right, like the energy is correct because these are careerists and they don't give a fuck, right? But also, uh, there was no way Donald Trump was going to be successful with the January 6th thing. The only reason why like this insurrection failed is because they did it in like the dumbest way possible. Do you understand? Like, what? You think like, like they're so fucking one note and so stupid that they unironically, what, thought that, like, if they stopped this symbolic process of certifying the fucking votes, that everyone was going to be like, oh, doy, I guess Donald Trump won? Who knows? Like, that's not how it... <laughs> that's, not, that's not how that works, you know what I mean? You can't just be like... Uh, like, it, it's still liberal. It's such a liberal fucking way of thinking. Okay? It is such a painfully liberal institutionalist way of thinking that you can like stop a symbolic certification process and then all of a sudden magically it's like well i guess our hands are tied do, do you see what i'm saying like even the hogs are liberal everyone's a liberal in america do you get it like if you truly want to do a fucking coup d'etat you have to secure loyalties and like hire uh in in in, in like the, the lieutenant class, you know what I mean? You need to secure loyalty in the generals. You need to like unironically by force uh, uh, take over all of these institutions. You can't just fucking stop a, a symbolic part of this process and be like, oh yeah, it's not working. Oh, oops. I guess, I guess our hands are tied. We can't do anything. So that's how it works, right? God damn it. Stop precogging. Okay. I'm just saying like, that's how you do a coup. And America knows how to do a fucking coup, okay? John Bolton said it himself, right? Um, so, it's pretty funny when you think about it, though. Bro, decent new. What do you think about casino streamers? By the way, I own a percentage of a big casino that is sponsoring streamers. I think they're fucking awful. Straight up. Like, literally, I think it's awful. I think it's, it's, uh, it's a horrible, horrible, crippling addiction that is suicidal. Uh, and, and hooking a bunch of random kids on the internet on this addiction is, is devastating. A little out of left field, but, you know, I'll always, I always got the smoke for that. Um, 14th Amendment, Section 2, no person shall be an elector, president, or vice president to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in the insurrection or rebellion. At the same time, wishful thinking law, he's going to win again with Ivanka as VP. Season 3 is going to be wild. Yeah. Oh, look at this. Look. Evaluate. Go ahead. We have a clear shot if we move quickly. We got smoke downstairs. Step Bro, they're owning the fucking uh, Capitol PD so I hard. It's pretty funny. Is, is that route compromised? We have this... 
is secure. However, we will bypass some protesters that are being contained. There is smoke, unknown what kind of smoke it is. Copy. Clear, we're coming out now, all right? Make a way. Genuinely don't understand why Gamba stream bad, but drinking stream good. No, drinking stream bad too, but not as bad as Gamba. Because when you watch a fucking drinking stream, you don't automatically materialize an alcoholic beverage in front of you. Okay, you still need to go to the fucking store. But when you watch a Gamba stream, you can very easily copy that behavior immediately, possibly while still watching the Gamba stream on the internet, and 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 fucking uh, go and and put your credit card information in there. There it is. Okay, that's the difference. At the Capitol. Three minutes later, the staff said the vice president was being pulled, which meant agents evacuated him from the Senate floor. At 2.24, the staff noted that the Secret Service agents at the Capitol did not, quote, sound good right now. Earlier, you heard from a security professional who had been working in the White House complex on January 6th with access to relevant information and a responsibility to report to national security officials. We asked this person, what was meant by the comment that the Secret Service agents did not, quote, sound good right now? In the following clip of that testimony, which has been modified to protect the individual's identity, the professional discusses what they heard from listening to the incoming radio traffic that day. Okay, that last entry in the page of service, the capital does not sound good right now. Correct. What does that mean? I think people around the gamma shit because Tran was talking about you and Austin Ox. What about me? Motherfucker, Austin Ox is not like an extension of me. He can't.